The teachers are taught, though, be sure to stress to the students that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Now, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class we should be teaching science. Things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Things like the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, then how did the world get here? We're here, you know. So that leaves only two choices. Somebody made the world, or the world made itself. There's no other choice. Well, there are a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all, we just think we're here. Okay, you can forget about those folks, right? We're here. So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, God created it, or the world just made itself like the humanists believe. It just is self-existing and not created. Well, if the world just made itself, how could this happen? Boy, the devil thought about that for a long time. And finally, one day, he came up with the Big Bang Theory. How many of you have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory before? I was on the airplane years ago, flying from Dallas to San Francisco, and I happened to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley. I don't know if you folks in Knoxville have ever heard of Berkeley or not, but Berkeley is not a Bible college. <laughs> so here I was on the airplane about that far away from this guy, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that, so I talk about it with him. And he said he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? He said, oh, it came from the Big Bang. I said, really? I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you have never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang. And I believe in the Big Bang, but my Big Bang is a lot different than yours. I said, you tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. And so the professor took off on one of those answers that looked like it came straight from the textbook. He said, well, <clears throat> Mr. Hoven, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago. That's a long time. All the matter in the universe. That's a lot of stuff. All the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. Say what? Everything in the universe squished into a dot smaller than a period on a page? Wow. That's one crowded dot. And heavy, too. <laughs> Hey, and it ain't the first time it happened, boys and girls. This textbook says, Someday, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no larger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then, another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. I said, Professor, uh, what happened to your dot? He said, Well, Hovind, 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the solar system was drawn into this little bitty tiny dot, and it was spinning. It spun faster and faster. And all of a sudden, shh, boom, it exploded, big bang. And the pieces that flew off became galaxies and sun, moon, stars, and here we are, you know, people, nothing but stardust. I said, sir, can I ask you a couple of questions, please? He said, sure, what do you want to know? You know, we got a three-hour flight sitting that far away from each other on the airplane, and I said, well, sir, I got a question. Uh, you said 20 billion years ago all the dirt got together for the big squish and the big spin and the big bang. Where did all the dirt come from? You know, who made matter? He said, we don't know that for sure. I said, okay, now, sir, hold it. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago God created the heaven and the earth, then you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I have no idea. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and you don't know where the dirt came from. So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell me my theory is religious and your theory is scientific. <laughs> no, 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 they're both religious. The news media tries to make it look like it is science versus religion. No, it's not. It's not science versus religion. This is two religions. Evolution and creation are both religious. You have to believe in one or the other. The difference is the evolution religion is tax-supported. That's the difference. One of many differences. I said, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure. What else would you like to know? Else? What do you mean else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, sir, does Berkeley uh, have a merry-go-round? How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round to your puke. You've been on them before? 
He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you really ought to get one. You know, you could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on there and get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. I'll tell you later. We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go faster, faster. Can't you go any faster? You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase two where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase uh, 60 miles an hour. They enter phase three where they start screaming again. But now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop, though. Keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, you should enter phase four. That's where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. Now, when this happens, you will notice a very interesting phenomena of physics. If the merry-go-round is going clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or a pole. That's because of a law in physics known as the conservation of angular momentum. See, if a spinning object breaks apart, the pieces that fly off are going to spin the same direction because the outside is moving faster than the inside. And we could talk all day about the conservation laws if you'd like, but the professor said, yes, I know about the conservation laws. I said, well, good, sir. Then let me ask you a question. If the universe began as a spinning dot, like you said, why do two planets spin backwards and probably three? He got real quiet, puzzled look on his face. I said, sir, why do eight out of 91 known moons spin backwards? Why do Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune have moons going both directions at the same time? Huh. Why is the sun 98% hydrogen and helium, but the other planets are less than 1% hydrogen and helium? And why are these nine planets so different from each other? If it all came from a big bang, I mean, what's, why are they all so different? Very different compositions. And why do some whole galaxies spin backwards? CNN did an article, Goofy Galaxy Spins in Wrong Direction. I said, sir, why are these things going backwards? He said, I don't know. Why do you think they're going backwards? I was hoping he was going to ask that. <laughs> I said, sir, it's real simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God did it that way on purpose just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. The Big Bang Theory is ludicrous for numerous reasons, okay? If the Big Bang Theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed, but it's not. Serious, serious problems with the Big Bang Theory. Even Fred Hoyle said, I have little hesitation in saying the sickly Paul hangs over the Big Bang Theory. is the sun shrinking. The sun is obviously burning. You can step outside and look at it in the daytime. The sun is losing about 5 million tons of mass every second. The sun is obviously burning and losing an enormous amount of fuel. So if you go backwards in time and add 5 million tons per second to the sun, you start to create a problem at some point. I don't know what the number is, and I wouldn't give a number because as soon as I give a number and say X number of million years ago this would have happened, the atheist or the skeptic will pick on the number and miss the concept. The fact is the sun is burning. If the sun were larger, it would begin to suck Mercury and Venus in, first of all, Mercury first and then Venus, and then slowly affect Earth. Now, the Bulletin of American Astronomical Society in uh, 1979 said, since 1836, more than 100 direct observers, different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at the rate of about a tenth of a percent each century, which works out to be five feet per hour. Now, whether the number's right, I don't know. But the fact is, it's pretty obvious the sun is burning, and the sun, for a hundred years of measurements, they said it's shrinking about five feet an hour. Of course, now the sun is gigantic, about 880,000 miles in diameter, so it's not a problem. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. Uh, Science Magazine ran an article in 1980 that said several d indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking, although these inferred collapse are only about one-seventh as much. By that thinking, the sun would have been touching the earth uh, 100, 158 million years ago. And again, I don't, that's not my number. Somebody else uh, came up with that as a possible calculation that the sun would have been touching the earth. The fact is the sun is shrinking. This chart shows the measurements of the not only the polar diameter but the equatorial diameter. The sun has... Uh, north and south pole like the earth does, 
both measurements are diminishing in the last 160 years. It's been observed the sun is shrinking. Now the sun oscillates, it swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks, but the overall trend is quite obviously toward shrinking. The sun is burning. That creates a problem. If you go backwards in time, the sun would be bigger and more massive, which is going to upset the gravitational pull. So I don't think it's logical to say the Earth's been going around the sun for billions of years while the sun is constantly losing this mass and losing its gravitational pull. Here. The world's population was only about a quarter of a billion. It looks like the whole population growth curve started about 4,400 years ago. Hmm. Now, if you believe in evolution, you've got a problem. You think man's been here for three million years. In three million years, the population would have grown. Right now, there'd be about 150,000 people per square inch. That would be crowded. No, man's not been here for millions of years. Darwin said, if my theory is true, numberless intermediate species ought to have you know, been found in the fossil record. Well, I'm sorry. This guy said, since Darwin, many of these links have been found. Oh, they are lying to you. No missing links have been found. Even David Robb, who believes in evolution, says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, you're kidding. Fantasy in the textbooks? That's a fancy word for a lie. <laughs> okay? And we could spend two days on the fossil record. There's no fossil record, and there are gaps all over the place. Every place where there ought to be something, they find nothing. No evidence for how the whale evolved, or how the birds evolved, or how the flowering plants evolved. No evidence whatsoever. Luther Sunderland wrote to major evolutionists all over and said, hey, where's the evidence for evolution? They wrote back and said, we don't have it, somebody else has it. He wrote to Colin Patterson because Patterson has access to the largest fossil collection in the world, British Museum of Natural History. Nobody's got more fossils than them. Patterson wrote a book about evolution, but he didn't show any missing links. So Sunderland wrote him a letter and said, uh, excuse me, uh, why didn't you show the missing links in your book? I'd like to see a picture of the missing link. Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. There are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. It's not a link they're looking for, folks. Even Stephen Gould said the absence of fossil evidence is a nagging problem for evolution. Yeah, it sure is. Stephen Gould died with a set of my videos on his shelf in his library. I hope he watched them. I donated them to him years ago, way before he died. Hopefully he watched them and got saved. I don't know. So Niles Eldridge and Stephen Gould have kind of resurrected the punctuated equilibria idea that came actually from Richard Gouldschmidt. Gouldschmidt said, the first bird hatched from a reptilian egg. They got so frustrated looking for missing links, they couldn't find any. They said, well, this just proves evolution happened quickly. Oh, I see. Yeah. And this bird that hatched from the reptile egg, uh, excuse me,
Who did it marry? Hmm. Don't you have to have two in the same place of the opposite sex? I mean, what if you get two males? Huh? And don't they have to be at the same time in history? What if one's born just 10 years before the other one? Oh, just missed it. You've got to get them in the same place of the opposite sex at the same time, and they've got to be interested. You've got a whole bunch of problems, okay? Serious problems. Then they tell the kids to think critically. Which theory best describes the organism's evolution? Gradualism or punctuated equilibria? Look what they do. Kids, which theory is the best explanation? Slow evolution or fast evolution? Do you see how they're giving the kids two options, both of which are false? Which is correct, boys and girls? Elephants are orange or elephants are pink? Uh, oh, man. Mom, what should I write for this one? <laughs> I don't know, honey. Go do your homework. They're neither one. The whole idea that ideas have consequences is look at our culture. Look, look at what's taught in our schools, our universities. Uh, we even have things that are taught that aren't even true. And they're known to be not true. There are things like uh, Heckel's embryo pictures that are still in current textbooks. And there's all these little embryo pictures of horse and cow and pig and, and human, and they all look exactly alike. Well, that was proven to be a fraud back in about 1884, and it's still in the textbooks. And so we have a, a system of delusion that is propagated out there that most people don't know, and they don't even know. But there's some people that do know, and they just keep doing it. One of the biggest lies kids face in the textbooks is about the geologic column. It's a joke. It's a hoax. It doesn't exist. The preacher said, hey, Brother Holford, let's go down to Rapid City. They've got a museum with dinosaurs. I said, man, I like dinosaurs. Let's go. We walked in the door, and this old fellow met us at the door, and he said, folks, I'm a guide here. Would you like me to give you a tour? We said, that would be great, sir. The first place we stopped on the tour was the geologic time scale. <laughs> We're standing there, and the guide said, now, folks, this layer of rock you're looking at right here is about 70 million years old. My daughter raised her hand. She said, uh, sir, how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, that's a good question, honey. He said, we tell how old these layers are by what kinds of fossils are found in them. They're called index fossils. She said, okay. We walked around the other side. We're standing over here, and the guide said, now, folks, these bones you're looking at are about 100 million years old. <laughs> My daughter raised her hand again. She said, uh, sir, how do you know the age of those fossils? He said, well, honey, we tell the age of the fossils by which layer they come from. <laughs> she said, uh, sir, when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? I thought, wow, a chip off the old block. <laughs> that guide had the strangest look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. <laughs> he looked at my daughter. He looked at me. I wasn't about to help him. <laughs> I thought, man, this is going to be good. I got to hear this. He looked back at my daughter. He said, man, you're right. That is circular reasoning. He said, I never thought of that before. That poor fellow drove 50 miles one way that night to hear me speak in Union Center, South Dakota. <laughs> Afterwards, he talked to me for almost, almost an hour. He said, Hovind, is everything I believe about geology wrong? I teach this stuff at the college. I said, oh, no, man, I like geology. Are you kidding? You've learned the names of all the minerals. Huh. That's a good trick, folks. There are 1,200 minerals. Some have names about this big. I said, you've learned the hardness test, the Rockwell test, the scratch test. I said, no, sir, I like geology. I like rocks and minerals. I have a huge fossil collection, a big mineral collection. I like, I like minerals. I said, but the part about them being different ages is all baloney. But he doesn't dare quit teaching it because he'll lose his job. See, people who don't support the evolution theory lose their job in public schools. That's the way it works. We cover more on that on video number seven. It's a carefully protected state religion. It's all based on circular reasoning. I'll show you. This textbook tells the kids on page 306 to date the fo ro fossils, or date, I'm sorry, date the rocks by the fossils. On the next page it says, date the fossils by the rocks. Circular reasoning, this is silly, okay? This guy says, the intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply. 
This guy says, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. If they tell you they date the fossils by carbon dating or potassium argon or one of those other ones, they're wrong. That's not how it's done. Fossils are dated by which strata they come from. Strata are dated by which fossils they contain. Circular reasoning. Radiometric dating would not even be feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. This guy says, the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> I think the cheese done fell out of his sandwich, folks. Okay. <laughs> How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? He divided the earth up into layers, and they gave each one a name, an age, and an index fossil. Maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park, named after the Jurassic layer. Each layer was given a name, and they told everybody how old it was. Now, this was done in 1830, long before there ever was carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead, to, lead 208, lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238. None of those existed. This was all done based on the assumption that each layer is a different age. They made up the whole thing out of the clear blue sky. Now, it's a fact the Earth has many layers of rock. No question. That's a fact, folks. How'd they get there? Well, there are two interpretations. The evolutionist will say, the layers formed slowly over millions of years, and each one is a different age. The Bible-believing Christian says, oh no, these layers are all from the flood in the days of Noah. You can get a jar of dirt, shake it up, set it down, it'll settle into layers for you in a few minutes. But the guys, again, who believe in evolution are always trying to erase the line and make you think their interpretation is part of the fact column. Just go home and get a jar of dirt and put some water in it and shake it up, folks. It'll settle out into layers for you in a few seconds. It's called hydrologic sorting. But here they are telling the kids the layers are different ages, and yet all over the world, petrified trees are found, like this one, standing up, connecting different rock layers. Now, if you have a petrified tree standing up, running through multiple rock layers, I don't think it's common sense to say the layers are different ages. Not by much, anyway. I mean, how long can a dead tree stand there before it falls down? Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 5,000 years? I doubt that. And yet, petrified trees in the poly, they're called polystrata fossils, going through multiple layers. They're very common. Hundreds and hundreds have been found. It would only take one to prove the point. But hundreds have been found, petrified, standing up. So don't let them tell you the layers are different ages. Sometimes, trees are found petrified upside down, running through multiple rock layers. Now we really have a problem. I've thought about this one until my brain hurts. As far as I can figure this out, the evolutionist only has two ways to solve this. He can say the trees stood upright for millions of years while the layers for slowly formed around them. Mm, I find that one hard to believe. Or he can say the trees grew through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. There's a third way to solve this. Maybe those trees were buried in a big flood. Mm -hmm. How fast was that calf going? Might be two ways to look at this, you know, yeah. When Mount St. Helens blew its top, it blew thousands of trees down into Spirit Lake. Over 20,000 trees are, have already sunk to the bottom and are stuck in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. Many thousands of them are standing up in the vertical position. And those trees are going to petrify. They're already beginning to petrify. It does not take long for things to petrify. Here's a piece of petrified firewood. I've got a piece of petrified pallet in our museum from a pallet shop that cut pieces of wood. Some kid sent me a box of petrified acorns. 
He said, Brother Hovind, I tried an experiment. I put these acorns in a bucket of water and forgot about them. A year later, I went out to, I thought maybe they might sprout, but now they're all petrified. Would you like some for your museum? I mean, they're solid rock. Here's a petrified dog inside a tree in Georgia. They cut the tree down for firewood and said, wait, 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 don't cut that one up. There's a dog inside. Turn to stone. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. The boot was made in the 1950s. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. Petrified hat from New Zealand. Here's a petrified pickle in our museum. <laughs> I'm not kidding. The guy sent it to me. He said, Brother Hovind, we found this old house in Montana. The roof was gone. The house had been empty for at least 30 years. We went down the basement. There's a bunch of jars of pickles, a pantry. But the lid to one of the jars rusted off, and inside the pickle turned to stone. Would you like it for your museum? I said, well, yeah. <laughs> a petrified pickle. The jar was made between 1930 and 1960. That's the year they made those jars. I don't know when the pickle got put in there, but sometime in there. Don't let them tell you it takes millions of years. There's petrified sacks of flour found in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, from a fl flour mill that flooded in the 1910s. We're down in Pensacola. We're going to be talking about Hurricane Ivan for a long time. Okay? And that's just one little storm. Can you imagine a worldwide flood? Man, they talk about that for centuries. Actually, our fact said's daddy, Shem, Noah's son, lived long enough to tell that story directly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You'll never catch that reading your Bible, but when you graph it out, it's like, wow. Do you know they're still talking about that flood in many cultures around the world? So far, 270 flood legends have been identified in different countries and cultures around the world. The Hawaiians have a legend that says, Long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Huh, one family saved in a boat full of animals. Sounds kind of like the Bible story, doesn't it? The Chinese have a legend called the Hiking Classic. They say that Fuhai is the father of their civilization. Fuhai is probably Noah. Okay? The story says, Fuhai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. He and his family were the only people alive on earth. After the great flood, they repopulated the world. Interesting. Now, the Mexican, the Tolik Indians in Mexico have a very interesting story. They said, the first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a flood that covered the highest mountains. One family named Coxcox survived. 1,716 years. Well, the Bible dates add up to uh, 1656 from the creation to the flood. But that's not bad for a legend 4,000 years old. Question, why would there be nearly 300 flood legends? Uh, I think it's because there was a flood. That's my theory. All you got to do is fly out west and look at the erosion patterns and say, man, this place was destroyed by a flood. I mean, the whole world was destroyed by a flood. Just fly around like I do and look out the window once in a while. Uh, the oldest languages in the world are kind of interesting. Origin of major writing systems from National Geographic. What do they say? Well, they say the oldest writing systems in the world started about 3000 BC. 5,000 years ago. Oldest writing systems. Hmm. And the oldest languages are modern, sophisticated, and complete. The Chinese said the year 2000 was the year 4700. They think they started their calendar with the flood. They called Noah Fuhai. The oldest recorded capital punishment 3,800 years ago. The Saxons had a genealogy going back to Adam. The Danes and Norwegians had a king list going back to Noah. Don't trust the Egyptian king list. That is greatly exaggerated. See the work by Corville on that and Evolution Cruncher. Why are the oldest reliable historical records less than 6,000 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. I bet you know what it is, don't you? Yeah. That Bible is absolutely right, folks. Absolutely correct, scientifically. The evidence for a young earth is overwhelming. The students aren't taught that. Students are only shown the evidence for an old earth. Remember the coins in the box? They better deal with the youngest ones. Not the oldest ones. These books aren't really science books anymore. They're books about evolution.